Um, which is an employer-led sector partnership that brings together 12 hospital partners and more than 15 strategic partners to support an inclusive uh, healthcare workforce, provide accessibility for unemployed and underemployed populations, and develop innovative responses to the evolving needs of the healthcare industry. Um, very quickly, we'll go through just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, first, I'll let you know that I have some construction going on uh, just outside my window, and I hope that uh, you'll be able to hear me. I won't be uh, talking for the most part today, so hopefully that won't get in the way. The joys of working from home. Um, uh, we are recording, so uh, we will share this recording afterwards with the entire collaborative, and I hope more people are able to learn from what we talk about here today. Please keep yourself on mute, unless of course you are presenting. Um, and while we will have opportunities for questions and hopefully a little bit of open dialogue towards the end, we won't have as much time as I would like for all of you to share your thoughts. So I encourage you to ask questions, comment and share resources in the chat. Um, However, I do want to iterate that this is a space for open and safe dialogue about the entire healthcare workforce development system. Uh, this isn't about selling or promoting any particular model or criticizing others, but about sharing diverse perspectives and insights for the good of us all. So as most of you who are joining us today are probably already aware, we have a growing demand for medical assistance in Chicago and across the country. To meet that need, workforce development practitioners have been experimenting with a variety of pathway program models. And in 2018, CHWC launched a medical assistant pathway program known as MAP, um, which provided a fully funded pathway into the medical assistant role for existing hospital staff. Uh, Westside United continues to manage that program in partnership with Malcolm X and with One Million Degrees, and they're currently moving into their fourth cohort. Um, but the first few years were not without some challenges. We found that participants weren't always increasing their salaries when they moved into a medical assistant role, and some were a little disappointed to find out that they weren't a bit closer to becoming a registered nurse. Um, and so since I joined CHWC in November of last year, I've learned a lot about MAP, um, as well as the national demand for MAs and the wide variety of training programs, different certifications, varying job descriptions, um, and different opportunities to advance that exist across the field. And so not surprisingly, I've also found that there are differing opinions about how MAs should be trained and what career pathways are available for them to advance. And so that's why I've put this conversation together today so that we at CHWC can build on the lessons that we learned from launching MAP. Um, so we can provide a friendly and collaborative space to unpack some of the misalignments and different perspectives and ultimately try to come up with some ideas to strengthen medical assistant career pathways in Chicagoland so that we meet our growing demand for MAs while also offering quality job opportunities to more people. Um, and I'll note that this focus on career pathways aligns with what the employer partners at CHWC have been talking a lot about lately, which is pathway mapping. Um, employers have noticed that it can be difficult to recruit and retain talent because career pathways up from entry level positions are not always clear. And therefore, they're difficult to communicate and market to employees and job seekers. Um, for example, it might be difficult for someone who works in a dietary role to understand their opportunities to advance through a clinical track or an administrative track. Um, and that could be because job titles and duties might be different within and across the systems. Um, it also might be difficult for them to navigate training opportunities and various tuition supports. And ultimately, it seems difficult to understand how much you know, input in terms of time and money will yield what kind of uh, job security and salary at the end of the day. Um, so right now at CHWC, we're trying to unpack this broad concept of pathway mapping to determine what exactly our goal is um, before we launch any specific sort of uh, project. Um, but I'm hoping that today's session can provide some inspiration and perhaps a launching point. 
Um, so again, that's why today I'd like to focus much of our discussion on pathways into medical assisting roles and then pathways up from entry level medical assisting to more advanced roles. So first today we'll hear from Chris Houston, uh, the Director of Healthcare Apprenticeships at Front Range Community Colleges, who will introduce the model that they developed in collaboration with the Northern Colorado Healthcare Partnership. And then we'll move, to, move into a panel discussion focused on the Chicagoland system with Christine Joga of Malcolm X College, Monique Cannon from Northwestern and Juan Jose Gonzalez from Ed Systems. Um, but first I'll just give you a quick snapshot of the medical assistant role. This is the general job description provided on the Department of Labor's Career One Stop website. It describes the role as both administrative with duties such as scheduling appointments, maintaining records, uh, billing and coding, and clinical duties uh, such as recording vital signs and medical histories, uh, prepping patients for examination, and drawing blood. Right now there are more than 16,000 MAs in Chicagoland and the projected growth in Illinois from 2019 to 2029 uh, is about 8% at the moment. Uh, we are a little ahead of the national curve in wages in Chicago. The medium, median hourly net nationwide wage is seven, $17.23. Well, in Chicago, we're up to uh, 1804 or about 37,500 per year. Um, and this is about a 14% increase over the median salary five years ago, which is a good sign. However, 25% uh, of our MAs are still making under $16 an hour. Um, there are several training programs in Chicagoland. And I know that a few uh, have representatives here today. So thank you for joining us. Um, the programs vary in cost and length quite a bit from as little as $1,000 to upwards of 20,000. And from as little as six months to up to uh, 15 months. Some programs are accredited, while several are not, and some programs require an externship, while others make the externship optional. Some programs have actually uh, recently closed or are training their final cohort, including Coin College and uh, Robert Morris, which was acquired by Roosevelt. But we're also seeing new programs launch at the same time, including a new program at National Lewis University and uh, an additional program at Midwestern Career Colleges that expands their um, existing MA program by adding some soft skills courses and requiring an externship. Um, and while medical assistants are not required to be certified by the state of Illinois, most of our hospital partners um, at CHWC do require their MAs to be certified and all of our training partners prepare their students to take certification exams. Um, so with that brief introduction, I'm I'm going to introduce Chris Houston. Chris, uh, you should be able to share your screen whenever you're ready. Um, Chris Houston serves as the Director of Healthcare Apprenticeships with Front Range Community College, working under a um, US Department of Labor grant to expand apprenticeships as a pathway for training in the healthcare sector. She has successfully implemented apprenticeships in four occupations with 12 local, large, medium, and small employers. Previous roles at the college include department chair of allied health at the Westminster campus and faculty and instructor roles. She has built and implemented several career and technical programs at the college, including health information technology, surgical technology, sterile processing, medical assisting, and phlebotomy. Um, she actively serves on several healthcare sector partnerships and works to build strong alliances with industry partners. Um, so we will have a, a couple of minutes for some question and answers with Chris when she's done with her presentation. So please feel free to drop some questions in the chat as, they, as, um, as you're thinking about them. And so they're ready to go once she is done. And then with that, I'll let you take it away, Chris. Thank you, April. And thank you for your time today. Um, as a formal faculty, I probably have more in this presentation than you need, but I'm sure April will have this available um, afterwards because it does have uh, quite a few resources. I'll pause at a couple points, April, but if you wouldn't mind, if there's a chat question comes up, just let me know. So we talked about my background and, you know, as April had mentioned, the, 
Bureau of Labor Statistics really projects that healthcare jobs will grow much faster than the average of all other occupations. And one note that, that I find quite interesting is 60% of all the jobs in healthcare are in allied health professions like medical assisting. And the other piece, um, due to COVID, um, sectors have lost a lot of employers, but um, healthcare initially did lose a little bit, but now is up substantially. So healthcare sector actually makes up a larger percentage of the um, employment than it did even pre-COVID. So as April mentioned, I'm working under a healthcare experiential pathway grant. This grant is built to enable um, more of our industry partners to utilize apprenticeship models as an entry level training and recruitment for meeting their entry level healthcare needs. And a lot of what I do is work with workforce. As April said, that is our partnership. Those of you who work at the community colleges know in our career and technical programs, we have strong alliances. And so the reason that we built this apprenticeship model is that we do know that we are going to need a lot more medical assisting assistance in the future. Medical assistants are a highly trained entry level position. So it's very hard to just hire off the street, train, but then the other pathway, the traditional model of going to school is not always effective for the time and the cost for the wages that they receive. Um, we really are looking for short-term cost-effective program, as April mentioned, kind of that time and money put in to what your wage equals when you get out. And then one of the things that we've shown is that these on-the-job learning options really customize the training for our local employers, and they want to have a say in what students are learning. The apprenticeship model is an earn while you learn. And so this enables these um, students slash apprentices to earn a wage at the same time that they're going to school. And the goal is livable wages for entry level positions in healthcare. One of our employer, our employers also talk about the retention issue. Many um, entry level medical assistants will often leave after six months to a year. And that constant turnover has been a big need to increase that retention. So apprenticeship pathway earn while you learn. We've shown a faster completion than a traditional model. Um, students finish their related instruction in 20 weeks, and I'll talk about that. We have much higher completion rates. 94% of our apprentices completed the program versus about 62% in our regular pathway. The employers really love the apprenticeship model because they had a big say in customizing those training needs. For example, when you're an MA, at an allergy doctor, you are going to do a lot more injections than if you're at an MA at a dermatologist where you're really going to be doing maybe more um, setting up tables for um, procedures. We've shown an increase in retention. And the other partnership that our employers have liked, it's really diversified our workforce. The community college that I work in, we're in three counties, but um, one of our counties, Adams County, is a primarily Hispanic serving institution. And so we've really been able to help our employers diversify their work their um, workforce. Just a review of apprenticeships. The on-the-job training for apprenticeships is uh, 2,000 hours. Our apprentices are complete with their training and credential and functioning and working solo long before the 2,000 hours. But after 2,000 hours, they will also earn a U.S. Department of Labor um, cert certification for medical assisting for an apprenticeship. The related instruction for apprenticeships must be a minimum of 144 hours. Our medical assisting program is 210 hours of related instruction. And each apprenticeship must be registered with the US Department of Labor. Um, right now, our community college has worked with third party vendors like a, our Chamber of Commerce to register apprentices, but we are actually going to take on sponsorship in the next year. One of the benefits for employers is that apprentices typically start at a lower wage and re receive one to two pay increases over the year. And apprentices work with preceptors, mentors, journey persons. The typical term in the trades is a journeyman, but we really are using more of that mentor preceptor. And then our apprentices earn credentials along the way. They earn their front range certificate of medical assisting. They earn a national certification with the National Health Association. And then after 2000 hours, they, they earn their US Department of Labor Apprenticeship Certificate. So one of the biggest things that we had to unpack with our medical assisting program is that our program really needed to be updated to match our industry needs. 
So over the past five years, we started with a 48 credit certificate. We've moved that to 35. And then after two years of that, we've now in the last two years moved it to 26 credits. This has been based purely on our employer feedback. What skills are necessary? We have actually moved away from accreditation because many of the national exams can be achieved not requiring accreditation. And we wanted to be more flexible for our providers. And a good example of that is coding. Medical assistants do very little medical coding. Typically, a practitioner will start the coding process. MAs do very little of that. So we have removed all of that coding process from our program, thus reducing some of those credits. Our traditional program is completed in two semesters. And our apprenticeship model is the related instruction is um, completed in 20 weeks. So we offer two models, uh, and this is really, again, to meet our employer needs. The first model is really where it works for larger healthcare systems. And these healthcare systems typically, as April mentioned, they want to promote their internal workforce, whether it's a CNA or environmental services or nutrition services, um, especially if they have any union representation and they want to demonstrate that pathway. So in this pathway, the employer hires that individual to train with no background in medical assisting. The apprentices work part-time, typically in an outpatient clinic for 24 hours per week, and they take they, they complete their medical assisting um, certificate at Front Range within 20 weeks. It's a mix of non-credit work that we transfer over to credit with coming to class eight hours a week, either two evenings or one day with online coursework. Within this model, we've had a 90, this one has been a 90% completion, and our model two has been a 96% completion, giving us about that 94. So in the model two, a lot of our smaller um, partners have mentioned that they need help recruiting. So they don't necessarily want to do the recruitment. So in this model, after our students complete one semester of our medical assisting program, we work with our employers for them to get hired on as an apprentice and learn their lab and clinical skills with on the job training instead of it in the classroom. So that enables them to learn things like blood pressure and point of care testing and EKGs with a preceptor in a real life setting. There's a little bit of, of fear that, that, that the apprentices and some of our employers are like, well, what are we gonna do with them until they're trained? But it's amazing how quickly students catch on when they've got the didactic experience and they're able to use real life patients to be learning. So those students will actually complete all the competencies required to finish the front range certificate with on the job learning. In the state of Colorado, we actually have a congressional mandate by our state legislature that requires us to utilize prior learning assessment to count credits that are earned from on the job learning. So we've mapped our competencies. What competencies do they need to complete the front range certificate? Those are a part of the on the job training. So these apprentices take one semester of, we call it a front loaded apprenticeship. They have one semester of, of community college work. And then they, for 15 weeks, they do on the job training and they sit for their national exam. So April, let me pause if there's any questions. Sure. Um, yeah, what is the, go ahead. Sorry, April, I was just gonna ask, what is the kind of the, the typical age of kind of the model one and model two and kind of, and what is their starting or the range of their starting salaries? Great question. You know, I don't know the age. I will have to go back and pull that data. We have that. I would say just from entering birth dates, which we do into the apprenticeship model, most of our MA apprentices are young, either single mother or, or young women. Um, most in our community that we recruit from are Hispanic. Um, some of, I would say to your point, the model one, we do tend to have an older work older um, individuals. And I will share some videos. I think I have the links in here. We did interview some of our apprentices and they said things like, I never thought I could go back to school, but when my organization supported me going back, I was able to change the job that I had done for years. So I will make a note to check that, but I would say model one tends to have a little bit older. Um, 
both uh, when as the sponsor, we set the minimum standard for what the wages are. The minimum is 15 an hour. So that's where they start. And most go up to about 18. So typically there's two wage increases. Some of our smaller employers are a little bit closer to the 17, 1750, but our larger employers are up to like 18. And I'm not sure how it is in Illinois, but in Colorado, our large employers, we probably have four large healthcare systems and they tend to own most of the private physician practice groups. So that's why they need those MAs for their private physician outpatient groups. They're not using MAs in a clinical hospital setting, but they use them in their medical practices. When we started with our apprenticeship model with model one with Centura Health, they had 85 openings for medical assistance in our state, which they could never meet. And since this project has been going on, they're bringing on anywhere from 25 to 40 MAs every six months. Okay, so they are meeting now, we're, they're meeting their needs in Kansas and statewide with our apprenticeship model for medical assisting. Other questions? Chris, I wonder if you could talk, uh, you could speak to the, the screening process as someone has asked in the chat. Yeah, that's a, um, what employers really like is to have control. So um, with model one, they do all the screening, all the recruiting, they hire whoever they want. And then they basically say, okay, here's the 12 apprentices that I want you to train. And we case manage them and getting them enrolled at the college. And we have an orientation night where we get them set up. And we put, we make this very easy because they're going for a job. So we try to make it so all of our online classes are put into one shell. So they only have to click one place instead of clicking on six different classes. We give them scrubs, we give them supplies, we give them their books all on the first day. So our goal, we sign them up for their registration exam. So the first model, all that recruitment is done by the, and hiring is done by the employer. In the second model, um, what I do is I go into every MA classroom and I announce the job opportunities for our local employers. And then we do not take part in any of the screening or hiring because we want that to be employer-based. So we give them the links. They work with the agencies to get hired. We do allow the agencies to utilize our faculty as a reference if, student release, if students release their FERPA waivers that allow for that to happen. Thanks, Chris. We also... Um had a question about ladders. I, I don't know if you uh, have this coming up in your presentation about positions that your MAs are um, looking to move into up and beyond medical assistant, um, like LPN or RN. Yeah, um, I don't cover that. And I do think that is a big issue with the MA position. You know, I, we are working right now with a local um, employer to do a CNA to LPN apprenticeship model but we don't, it's such a different scope of practice. And the, the, the way that I phrase it to people, it's the next step really after MA is really getting into like RN or PA or MD. And it's, it's none of the classes that you take here are really applicable to those pathways. So we're looking to try to help MAs expand their scope of practices. We're doing some EKG certifications with them, phlebotomy certifications. And the benefit of that is that it just expands any PRN opportunities they also have with that organization. So it's, it's a big jump. And I think that's something that our employers are going to need to really unpack because MA can be kind of a, a ending position and there are, you know, the pay doesn't really warrant a whole lot of that. So I think we'll be interesting to see if we can start adding other credentials to make them more marketable and increase their pay. So I'll continue and then I'll pause again for some questions. But um, it, as I mentioned in model one, a lot of the large employers like this because they can upskill their incumbent workers. And they, employers like this because they can cast a broad net and have large recruiting pools. Um, employers, our larger employers um, provide, uh, sorry, that should be tuition support. Our larger employers provide tuition support for our students. Um, apprentices are working part-time because remember they're completing an MA certificate in 20 weeks. And so they're only working 24 to 32 hours a week for the first 20 weeks. 
and then they tag off to get to their higher rates. Um, the smaller employers like to use the college as an opportunity to help recruitment. Apprentices and students are very excited for this model because they really pay minimal tuition in that second semester. It's typically one or two classes that they're finishing. And the employers like this because they have a very customized training. They get to teach exactly how they want their blood pressure and their charting to be done. We have noticed through some interviews of apprentices that the loyalty at which those apprentices feel for that organization is higher. And that also may be um, supporting that, that retention. So I mentioned the completion rates as well. So into the specifics, we use some non-credit classes. The main reason that we use non-credit classes is we need a big, we needed a different part of term. And anybody in higher ed knows parts of term and financial aid regulations really dictate when you can offer classes. So we're able to offer a non-credit class in which we can use that PLA process to grant the student those credits back to their transcripts so they can receive their certifications. We do provide 15 weeks of hands-on classroom work, eight hours, one day a week. And this is something that I've really encouraged those of you who are looking at apprenticeship models. You really have to look at your times that you offer courses. Students can't work, apprentices can't work and come to class from 11 to two. So the coursework really needs to be evening weekends or one day per week. Um, a couple other highlights, um, our total program cost is about $4,000. Um, that's this first model where we use a wide variety of funding from employer um, tuition support to workforce support. Very few of our students have paid any out of pocket. And many employers for this model do require a contractual agreement to stay for one year. So one of the things that I would recommend um, as, as you're looking at these models, so how to make an apprenticeship successful, you really need to do engage your employers because that's the thing I learned the most. What do they want? Um, small employers may want something different than medium or large employers. And really look at the competencies in your programming. And I gave that example of coding. Very few MAs, if any, do coding anymore. So orthopedics is another good one. Unless you're an MA in an orthopedic office, most offices don't cast or splint in office anymore. So there's a lot of things that you can tailor out of your program that are really more specialty. Look at non-credit options to condense time to completion and give yourself more flexibility. Workforce has a lot of great tuition support, so be very active with workforce. They can also feed a lot of people into your program. If you can, if you have the bandwidth to sponsor, it really helps the employer. And then I would say lastly, as you know, with many of our programs, if you have a robust system that really increases your completion, provide information sessions, give orientation sessions. We do monthly check-ins with the apprentice and the preceptor. We offer something called open lab on Saturday mornings for two hours. I pay an instructor. Any apprentice can come in and just practice blood pressure, practice vena punctures. It gives them a little bit more confidence building. And then find ways to support your preceptors. We had a preceptor that, was, that wanted a textbook. And so I got her a textbook. So these are all ways that you can support that programming. Some of the challenges that I faced is, and I know a lot of you who work in higher ed, we're not always in sync with what employers need. And I think that's one of the things that I would emphasize the very most is get to know what your employers need. Um, and I really, in that role as, as you know, director of career and technical ed programs, that's really what our need is. Um, help students develop that professionalism early on. A lot of the reasons that apprentices didn't get hired is because they didn't interview well. We tend to build that when they get ready to go to externship. We've had to really push this back to have more professionalism at the beginning of our program. Work with your college systems. Don't try to make a different pathway. We've done a lot of work to make sure we're following our registrar and our financial aid and our, you know, cashiers, you know, and then really set clear expectations. We had an apprentice that didn't like her job and wanted to quit, but she didn't realize that she couldn't finish her MA certification if she quit her job. So making sure we now actually do a student memorandum of understanding with each student. So really setting those clear expectations. And then support systems. It's amazing what a two hour a week tutor will do to help a group of students. I've put a lot of kind of how we met our needs with this program um, that I've talked about. But I think one of the, the things that we've really learned is that 
students working on the job learn the skills better than when they just work in the classroom. And so students are more competent and more likely to complete because they're working in this space anyway. And then I've got some resources, um, the apprenticeship.gov website, the National Health Association talks a lot about how apprenticeships are filling the needs. Um, I put our website and then Harper College in your area is, is very involved in apprenticeships, not so much in healthcare, but anytime I have apprenticeship questions, they've always had good, good answers. This was one of my quotes, um, Chelsea, the apprenticeship program combines book knowledge with real life experience. This has tremendously impacted my learning. I'm learning things in a real clinic with real patients instead of only studying theories in a textbook. I feel prepared to enter the workforce. So that is a little bit of, um, about what we're doing. I'm, I'm happy to answer some more questions. Thank you, Chris. Um, we have a couple of minutes to do a question or two before we move into the Chicagoland panel. Um, one that um, Zafer, I've, uh, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name, is asked in the chat is, um, what has been the turnover rate for these students at some of the larger employers, if you know, um, and if there are any specific reasons they uh, may have turned over? So great question. So it, it in the first year after they complete their, so again, the 94% completion, and keep in mind, we've just been doing this for the past two years, really a year and a half. So we've really been impacted by COVID. So I know of two students, one student left our program because both of her parents had passed away from COVID. And then another student, her husband was in the military and was transferred. Um, and then our, the last student that I can think of that didn't complete, she herself had COVID and missed so much class she had to step out. So I don't feel like I have really good data on that yet because COVID was such a big impact. But what the, the employer Centura is showing is that after that first year, because remember they're in a contractual agreement, so you don't count that year, is that they've still retained 84% of the people that started in the program. So that's making them happy because they're having to do less recruitment because they have a higher retention. And actually in our farm tech program, we've been doing it for two years with them. This is the first year they didn't even need a cohort because every, let's see, we, of the probably 15 apprentices, I think they've got 12 of them that are still working for them after two years. Thank you, Chris. Um, I also wanna ask, are there, you, you spoke to some of the supports that you provide to employers. Um, anything else that you do to support employers to help the MAs be successful and grow? One of the things that has been the most helpful is our grant provides wage support for the first year for employers with 50 or less. So during COVID, when a lot of the large health systems were not bringing on a lot of new MAs because outpatient clinics were closed, we were really focusing on our small employers and that was such a good bridge for them. Um, I do know that the um, federal government is looking at a student apprenticeship bill that's actually going through Congress right now. The Senate is looking at it. And one of the areas in that is to figure out ways to support preceptors. Um, our larger health systems will provide a one to $2 an hour pay raise during the time they're precepting. And that's an important thing to incentivize and to complement the extra work that they're doing. So I think wage support when possible, preceptor pay when possible. And then I think just being a resource, like I said, we try to do monthly touch base, whether it's email or in person, just to see what their needs are. And maybe they'll say, oh, well, she just doesn't feel confident in being a puncture. So then we'll say, okay, let's work on that in open lab. So I think good communication and just ways so that they don't feel like they're the only one training this apprentice. Thank you. Um, and then I'll end on this um sort of combining Laura and Chanel's questions here. Um, I know you already spoke to this, Chris, that it's, a, it's an issue that there isn't a clear pathway into an RN role um, or an LPN role. Are you or any of your colleagues um, thinking about um, alternative pathways possibly into administrative roles um, or anywhere else where, uh, where they could earn uh, $20 an hour or more? Yeah, those are great questions that we continually to grapple with. Um, we have looked into the medical lab tech. Um, again, accreditation, I, as you know, for those are very difficult. And part of the issues with the community colleges are being able to hire 
uh, enough of the actual instructors because so many of them are working. So it's we the only thing that we've done is tackle some of the additional certifications to increase their scope of practice. But I think those are those are really really good questions that if we want a solid long term workforce of MAs, we are going to have to look at ways to pathway them to higher careers. Well, thank you. That is exactly what I wanted to talk about today. So we'll uh, we'll end on that note. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris. I hope you'll um, stick around and um, hopefully we'll have time at the end of the day for a little bit more um, open discussion. Um, right now, I'd like to start our panel of Chicagoland practitioners um, who are um, all working in this area. Um, first, I'm going to introduce Christine Joga, who is the director of the medical assisting program at Malcolm X College, um, one of the city colleges of Chicago. Christine successfully led the medical assisting program through specialized accreditation through the Commission on Accreditation of Allied Health Education Programs and the Medical Assisting Education Review Board. And aside from running the six cohorts of students, Christine also manages the Medical Assisting Pathway Program, which partners with 1 million degrees, Lurie's, Lurie Children's, North Shore, Sinai, uh, Rush, and University of Chicago. Christine has previously presented with CHWC and has also presented at the American Medical Technologist Conference, educating professors on the use of technology and simulation in the classroom. Um, she has authored Steps Up training models for the American Medical Association, uh, including requirements for retention of medical assistance in practices. She is currently reviewing and authoring simulation modules for medical assistance for McGraw-Hill Publishing. And Christine also serves as a speaker for the Chicago Area Health Education Center and a board member of AMT Illinois Chapter. Thank you so much for joining us, Christine. Um, I'll just I'll just jump right in um, since I, I, I think that many of the people who are on the call today are somewhat familiar with your program at Malcolm X. Um, we just heard from Chris talking about the need to, you know, have a more short term program um, and how her employers were on board for that. Um, and there are several shorter MA programs out there in Chicago right now. Malcolm X's full time MA program lasts uh, three semesters. So tell us, why do you feel that the three semesters are necessary to train quality candidates? We took a different approach. So we went holistic. Um, while we were doing extensive market research with all of our stakeholders, we included our students and we also had to address the needs of the Chicagoland area. So for anyone who doesn't live in Chicago, we're extremely segregated city. Uh, we are the one city college that holds the medical assisting or healthcare programs. And so we had to address the needs of all of our stakeholders. Um, what we found was we decided to do a selective enrollment program. We wanted to make sure that everyone was at college level English, college level math. Uh, we, from there, they have to interview, complete an essay, um, once they're accepted into the program, and we take 60 students for every um, semester that we start. We have a full-time and a part-time option, so we are producing medical assistance um, at a high rate, but we found that we needed to spend more time with our students in the classroom. So as we saw that our students were in the range of 24-year-olds, um, the soft skills dropped dramatically compared to what the healthcare needs were. Um, patients demand extreme, um, you know, we train them on the clinical skills, on the administrative skills, we assess them, we have a sim center that we utilize, but what we added into our classes were a lot of soft skill training, and so we utilize our sim center for that, where we are, we are fortunate because we have a beautiful sim center with an ambulatory area for medical assisting, so we actually have three clinical rooms. We have a front desk we can work at. They are all camera ready. So while we're running through different scenarios, we're able to record the students and they're able to see themselves and then we debrief. And that's really a teaching moment because they can actually see what they look like. Um, but we also took it a step further. So the portion of that class that gets a little bit uncomfortable for students is we address personal biases, we address diversity in healthcare, we address racism. Um, because in order, we want them to be aware, 
so that when they're front facing with a patient, they're delivering good patient care. And that takes time to develop. Once you hit the clinical floor, it's a little too late to start developing those skills. Um, clinical managers have told us they just don't have the time to teach soft skills. They're more apt to support if you need help with EKGs or phlebotomy, that's much easier for them. But if you don't know the please and the thank you and to maintain eye contact, they just don't have the time to train you. So we took the time, we took that off their plate. Um, and if I can say anything from all my years in healthcare and being a medical assistant, so I started as a medical assistant, um, I pathway through to administration, but one of the things is that patients expect you to be good at what you do, but they also want you to care about who they are. And so we, we follow that train of thought and train the students that way. Thank you, Christine. Um, I appreciate the attention you pay to diversity. Um, that is something I hadn't heard before. Um, so that's impressive. Um, in your experience, what are the opportunities um, that exist for MAs to advance in their careers? And how does the Malcolm X program support their career advancement? That's a loaded question. So <laughs> let me break it down. If we're thinking of medical assistants in general, if you're just talking about a medical assistant, there's not a lot of room for growth in that role by itself. Um, it's an expansive role. Um, you're an extremely cross-trained individual, so you can literally be thrown in any areas. Um, but what I found is we have students who return or students who enter our program. So right now, 25% of our students are actually in other programs completing their physician's assistant training. So they're taking all of their medical classes, but they're jumping into our program so they can get that clinical hours to support their applications to PA programs. Um, we're quite successful in that. Most of them enter PA programs. I've also seen a lot of our students um, go into management. So a lot of our students who were year one were a four-year-old program. They're already in clinical manager roles. Um, I love when I get these emails from students telling me like, I'll take students. And I'm like, oh, big manager now. Um, or I've seen, and I cannot understand this yet, and I've also, you know, I've talked to our radiology department. I see a lot of students come back and want to get into our radiology tech program quite a bit, um, which I ha we haven't figured out the correlation yet, but it's there. Uh, and then, of course, nursing. And what we do is we here, we just start with advising. So if a student kind of has an end goal, the advising will work, the advisor will work backwards toward their goals. Um, since our courses, some of them are, can meet electives. So, you know, they, they generally just look at what they're working toward and match, match up their pathway that way. Um, our transfer center is amazing. So for instance, if you're following in the track that I did, I went into healthcare administration. I was a medical assistant for many years. Um, then I went into a clinical manager and I wanted to get higher up. So I went into healthcare administration and our, that is something that our transfer center works on so that these students can transfer into higher um, institutions. And then of course we have our career center that just does an amazing job with assisting them in getting other roles. I have students who are holding medical assisting credentials and actually working in, in research. So they've been lab techs and research departments. Um, it varies. I mean, they're so cross-trained that they can be utilized anywhere. So it's, it's amazing. It's hard. It's almost hard to create a, a, a straight pathway. But we're trying. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, you, I know that you are partnering with Dr. Marie Brown of Rush University and Dr. James Jerzak of Bell and Health on a medical assistant recruitment and retention toolkit. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that toolkit and what you're trying to achieve? And specifically, could you share some of the um, high-level recommendations related to um, retaining top talent that you're putting in that toolkit? So the toolkit was created to demystify medical assisting. If you ever ask someone who isn't aware of what a medical assistant is, they could never answer that question correctly. Um, I was shocked when I came to Malcolm X and I did a presentation on my program and I decided to do Q&A with administrators. And I said, do medical assistants answer phones? And I was like, no, do they draw blood? No, everyone said no to every question. I'm like, what do you think we do downstairs? It was, should have been yes to every question. But most people don't understand 
the role. Most people don't understand the different credentialing bodies, how you can get credentialed. So specifically um, the RMA, there's nine different routes you can get credentialed. Um, and that means that your medical assistants that you're hiring are trained much differently. And so one of the things we heard when we did a lot of research was they could not understand why they hire a medical assistant and they have somebody who on their resume has 10 years of experience, um, but then they put them on the floor and they can't draw blood. If you dug deeper, you may have seen that, yes, they have 10 years experience, but they were trained on the job and on the job could have meant that you never left the front desk. So you are a medical assistant and all you can do is answer phones, schedule appointments, but you were never trained in clinical skills. So I would say as high level takeaway, um, you know, make sure that you're digging a little deeper. Don't just look at a resume and say years of experience and a credential. Read that resume and, and have some follow-up questions. Another um, area that we have seen, and, and I even face this as a medical assistant, is you get thrown on the clinical floor and you're expected, for some reason, unlike nursing or anything else, you're just expected to know it all and be ready on day one. Nurses come in, they have um, training available, and you know, doctors have residency, medical assistants are thrown in there and it's do or die. And so I would say, make sure there's a good onboarding process so they feel comfortable in the role and they don't burn out quickly. Um, and I've seen a lot, like Rush does a lot of team-based team, um, work. So does Northwestern here in the Chicagoland area. And so it's basically um, bringing in the medical assistant as part of the team and making sure that they, they know their role and, and they feel comfortable so they don't feel like an outcast because you can feel you're the center of the whole facility. And in, in a lot of ways, I say it's like an air traffic controller because you have your hands in a lot of different areas. But um, if you haven't been trained well and you can't connect the dots, then it, it becomes difficult and they burn out and they leave. And then I'm going to have to say this compensation. <laughs> compensation is huge. Thank you, Christine. And I know you've also highlighted in that toolkit um, some good examples of employers who have created, you know, MA Tier 1, Tier 2, Lead MA. Um, uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're seeing more uh, systems start to have a, a, a career ladder within medical assisting. Um, is, is that correct, Christine? Correct. So one of the things we're looking at in the Chicagoland area is working on tiers. And so I'm seeing a lot of medical groups looking at, okay, maybe we have entry level and you, you are, we're going to utilize, you know, maybe we'll let you do injections or just take vitals, or you're just going to run the front desk. And then you have worked here for a certain amount of time. You're going to move up to a level two medical assistant. Now you're drawing blood. They're going to utilize more and more of your skills and leading up to possibly clinical manager, which is something that medical assistants historically have done um, before all the big medical groups bought up all of these smaller, um, all the smaller, you know, all of the, just the offices themselves. So if you ever went into an office pre having all these big um, medical groups, the medical assistants were running the whole office. Generally, there wasn't a nurse there, it was a doctor and several medical assistants. And you always had someone who was a lead or a manager who ran the whole thing. And so it's just sort of a shift going on. Thank you, Christine. Those insights um, are very helpful. Um, we'll move on, but we will come back to you. Yeah. Um, now I'm going to introduce Juan Jose Gonzalez, who uh, began his career as an immigration rights organizer for the Illinois Coalition of Immigrant and Refugee Rights, where he mobilized immigrant citizens to vote and lobby at the state and federal level for better immigration policy. He then served as the Chicago director for Stand for Children Illinois, leading their advocacy and policy, policy efforts in the region. Afterwards, he was director of youth and education policy for the city of Chicago mayor's office under Mayor Rahm Emanuel managing a portfolio that included elementary and secondary education policy, college access, summer employment, and out of school time opportunities. These work experiences led Juan Jose to his current role as the Pathways Director for the Education Systems Center. Um, he's heavily involved in the implementation of the Illinois Post-Secondary Workforce Readiness Act, 
the co college and career pathways endorsements framework and other dual credit pathways in school districts and communities throughout the state. Um, Juan Jose received his BA at Princeton University and a master's in public policy from the University of Chicago Harris School. Thank you for joining us, Juan Jose. Um, Thank you all. First, why don't you just describe your role with Ed Systems and the work that you're doing to map college and career pathways? And specifically, what are you trying to find out or achieve with um, health science pathways? Yes, thank you. So, uh, you know, Education Systems Center, we are officially part of uh, Northern Illinois University, but we operate much more like a policy uh, think tank and implementation arm. And our big focus uh, since our inception has been college and career pathways, the bridges to post-secondary, so like dual credit or transitions to post-secondary institutions, and also like longitudinal data systems with the state, but also at the local level. I have been very much heavily involved in the implementation of secondary pathways that kind of naturally transition and easily transition to the post-secondary space and getting students in the high school level to start getting a more robust pathway experience, more so beyond than the traditional CTE, secondary CTE programs, right? Like, yes, you should have some CTE coursework, but are you offering, are you getting access to dual credit, early college? Is your work-based learning experience more robust and more kind of uh, um, adjustable to kind of the current market demand and employer demand as well. So I've been heavily involved in the implementation of now model pathways that that kind of transition and blend in the blend the lines from high school to post secondary through a project called the Model Programs of Study with the Illinois Community College Board, which and we've created model pathways and model programs of study in health science and you know have kind of supported Chicago public schools in the creation of a model pathway now as a part of the Chicago roadmap and pilot schools and a health science pathway. One of the things that we're really looking at and seeing in healthway pathway space, one of the kind of our key benchmarks edit systems is that when recommending education providers, whether it be a high school, a school district, or colleges, you should really be kind of presenting young people pathways that are benchmarked to the potential for a living wage occupation, right? And if that, and that role is not leading to a living wage occupation, it should have stackability or flexibility to kind of build towards something else, right? So in, in our model programs of study guide, uh, and I'll put a link shortly after, you know, we looked at all the, all the programs offered by a typical community college in Illinois and kind of excluded those programs that were not leading to living wage jobs and tried to emphasize for young people, like these are the roles that you should be getting to or striving for when you're starting young. And obviously that would be different for like an adult trying to reenter the workforce, a single mother or someone who's just as involved or things that make sure, right? But in creating these seamless high school to secondary pathways, what will lead to student success and what should, there, should be their aspiration? And that's been a key unique focus of ours in health science. Thank you. Um, and on that note, when uh, high schools tell you that they're interested in building pathways into MA programs because they know that this profession is in high demand and only growing. What do you tell them? I try to advise them against that when targeting an audience of young high schoolers, right? I feel that a young high schooler should not, should have an aspiration that's kind of uh, not only whether it's not it's a bachelor's degree, I think that's actually not the the key benchmark that a high school young person should strive for. But really, as a high school person starting in a pathway or a young person should be aiming for careers with a living wage occupation that can sustain themselves and the child if they were like a young adult, right, or living on their own. So that's really in in the medical assistant program. Typically, in most community colleges, is a dead end role. It doesn't stack to anything. It doesn't build to anything. Or the coursework doesn't is not as flexible as it should be in regards to maybe transferring to other programs like nursing or kind of uh, administ administrative or business, right? So trying to advise them like, hey, if you're going to be offering dual credit opportunities or early college opportunities for young people, this should be kind of like an industry credential they earn, but the foundation of the pathway should really be leading them to other roles or have the flexibility to lead to other roles, right? So one thing I do commend with City Colleges of Chicago in this case, right, is that their medical assistant program includes anatomy and physiology and medical terminology, which is not common in other kind of medical assistant pathways in the state, but in City Colleges, those two courses are easily and quickly transferable to so many of their other high value kind of living wage occupations that that young person would be able to transfer their credit 
So other programs should they want to choose like radiology or nursing, right? So that's like a positive feature that I think is being done well in Chicago, but it's not a common practice. So it's really about like, hey, I know you, there's been a lot of focus in CT on earning an industry credential at a high school level, but I would say that more valuable is earning strategic dual credit and, early, and kind of work-based learning opportunities that would lead to a more like building process. And the medical system credential could be like a nice to have, but not essential at the high school age. Thank you. So what information should young people, young people be presented in regards to pathway progressions and endpoint occupations? And how can training programs align to that information? Yeah, we, so at that system, we recently started implementing a statewide student advisory council and just kind of vetting a lot of our policy recommendations, vetting a lot of our research and data to a younger person audience. So many times we talk only to adults and we can, we create material that is digestible by adults, but not necessarily young people, right? So what I've come to realize, young people can really digest this notion of a living wage. And we liked, and we shared with them the MIT's living wage calculator as a tool that's like very easy to digest and kind of play around with and kind of realize what is the living wage necessary for yourself as an adult, yourself and a child, yourself and two children, so on and so forth. So I think young people need to know that, know what the living wage is for their region, know, what, know how to use the Department of Labor's kind of profile of an occupation is kind of similar to what you did earlier in the presentation, April, and then allow young people to weigh those variables when choosing their career, right? Like, yes, I want to do something that I like. Maybe let's say they say, I want to be like in film, right? Like, okay, these are the various roles in film. Allow them to weigh or choose those options based on the variables of lingual age and kind of occupational profile. So I don't think, I think they know that what, I've, what my research is showing is young people know the minimum wage, but they don't realize that the minimum wage as, they, as uh, established by law is not parallel to the living wage. And when, they, and when that kind of reaches them, they, be, they start to make more practical decisions than they used to before. So um, that's something that I think that employers need to understand. Young people are gonna make a cost benefit analysis about the, the potential of a program. I used to, when I worked at the city, Many unions into come to us and like, how come young people don't want to apply for our apprenticeship programs or don't want to be a part of our union? And I was like, I think young people are smarter than you think, and that they're making a cost-benefit analysis, right? Like the amount of time it takes me to apply, get screened, be selected into your program. I would much rather just start working at Starbucks right away for minimum wage and build up there than like a year-long practice to maybe get screened and still excluded from you, nevertheless, because I'm black or Latino, right? So. Um, employers need to realize that these young people, if you're going to be appealing to them in the workforce, you got to really make the cost benefit of time and training worth it. Thank you, Juan Jose. Um, with that, I'm going to move on to Monique, um, and I will come back to you um, for at least one more final question. Um, and. As we hear from Monique, I encourage anyone to put some questions in the chat that they have for um, anyone after we've uh, heard from all three of our panelists. Um, so Monique Cannon is a healthcare professional with extensive experience in management skills and allied health, currently employed by Northwestern Memorial Healthcare as the program manager of their medical assistant program. Uh, Monique earned her master's in strategic management from Indiana Wesleyan University in 2013 and a bachelor's degree in business administration with a minor in organizational leadership from Trinity University in 2010. Monique also earned her certification in medical assisting in 1993 and has maintained certifications as an RMA um, and allied health instructor awarded by the medical, American Medical Technologist. Monique has 21 years of allied health instruction and 13 years in academic program management and partnership development. Um, in her current role, she develops a curriculum design, oversees all management responsibilities for the program, um, develops externship partnerships and instructs the program. Uh, Monique has a passion for healthcare and academics that aligns with the Northwestern Healthcare Patient First Mission. Thank you for joining us, Monique. Um, First, why don't you just give us a high level summary of the Northwestern Clinical Schools and of your MA program. Um, tell us why you launched this program, what, what the goals are and who you're seeking to enroll. 
Well, hello, everyone. I just, um, just to answer that question that you just asked, Northwestern really wants to meet the demand. Like everyone has said, Christine and Juan, we have a very high demand for medical assisting. And we've been trying to get a program off the, off the ground for many years. And they finally decided to just put this in motion because of the high demand. Um, I am the newest member of the clinical schools, the medical assistant program is, but the Northwestern Medical Assistant uh, Clinical Schools has been around for more than 14, 15 years. Um, and basically they have a diagnostic imagery kind of community until I arrived with medical assistant. So um, our schools consist of diagnostic sonography, radiation therapy, CT, MRI, um, radiology. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Uh, we have seven programs. So as I stated, I am the newest member. We're trying to reach the high demand um, for medical assisting. And so we started this program in 2018. And as we started the program, we really went out into the community to try and get some insight on what was needed um, as far as cost was concerned. We did market analysis for costs for various schools around the um, Chicagoland area. So we really wanted to tap into those individuals that really wanted to go to school but really couldn't afford it. However, we wanted to keep it affordable. Um, we have a dynamic program that we are offering. And we right now we're building the program um, just basically to get those um, medical assistant job responsibilities taken care of in the healthcare sector. And we are open to suggestions. I think this uh, forum is a great forum to join because it not only you know, gives insight for what is needed um, in medical assistant or healthcare, but it also gives insight to who we really want to invite into these programs and how we can cultivate those individuals into being the best uh, patient care technicians we can have out there possible. Thank you, Monique. And I, um, I also wanna share with everyone that um, the medical assisting program with the Northwestern Clinical Schools only costs the student uh, $1,000 to participate, correct? Um, yeah. And is open to anyone with a high school diploma who passes um, some type of test, forgive me. Uh, is that correct, Monique? Yes, I'll, I'll give a little bit more insight. We have a 10 month program here. And what we do, they spend nine months um, in didactic training in the classroom. The 10th month, they go into an externship, a 160 hour externship where they demonstrate all of the skills that they learned in the classroom. This gives our employers uh, 160 hours to basically interview that externship student. So what we do, our focus is to basically place those students in possible job positions for to be hired after um, they are finished with their externship. And like she said, um, April said, our program is only $1,000. And bundled into that $1,000, we give them uh, four uniforms. We bundle their books with that. And we also pay for the first attempt of the RMA certification exam. Um, now there is a criteria that the individuals have to meet uh, during the application process. And so first, um, in order to enter the application process, of course, you have to fill out an application, but you also have to meet the criteria. Um, we want at least a high school diploma or a GED. They must have a C average, which a 70% or better. And we do require um, that they send in their transcripts. And then after they're accepted and they meet the criteria, then we move them on into an AccuPlacer exam. And the AccuPlacer exam gives us insight um, to understand what they've learned in high school. So it's a basic reading and math um, test that we give them and they must score at least 70%. And the reason why we give them those tests is because we teach pharmacology and we also teach medical terminology and anatomy and physiology in our program. And so we want to make sure that they're able to, to keep, you know, keep up in the program. Our program is 10 months, but it's very accelerated. Um, and we wanna make sure 
that we're able to meet their goals in healthcare. And then after that, we send them through a behavior interview. So they meet with myself and the rest of the program managers of the clinical schools, as well as our clinical manager. And we sit with them and we uh, create an atmosphere, a very welcoming atmosphere, but we take them through an interview process because we want to get to know them and we want to be able to meet their needs. And so after that interview process, uh, what we do, we, we do recommend that they have, um, they have, they send in acceptance letters. So someone has to give them um, the approval to, to uh, enter the program. And then after that, we welcome them into the program. We start every year, September, and we end with externship in June. Um, so those personal reference, what I meant, the, the letters, uh, the acceptance, they have to have personal references. And then we talk to the people that um, give them the personal references and we get a little bit more insight on who they are and what they've been doing prior to us. And after that, um, like I, I said, our program starts September and it ends with the externship in June. And we try to place them into the Northwestern Medical Group um, clinics so that they can have their available or they're able to perform in those clinics. Thank you, Monique, for that um, overview of the clinical school. Um, I want to shift a little bit because I know that you've been working for Northwestern for a while and you were a medical assistant yourself. Um, you told me about a medical assistant task force that Northwestern convened in 2017. Can you tell us a little bit about that project and about what Northwestern learned from your MAs um, and how Northwestern responded? Yes. So the focus of that task force was basically, we wanted to retain our medical assistants and we saw a downslide in, a, well, a turnover. Uh, they were leaving. And so what we did, we didn't want to send out surveys. Uh, we wanted to be very personal with our approach. And so we went and we sat down um, in every region that Northwestern has medical assistants. And we really talked, we spoke about medical assistants what we can do better as an institution, what they were looking for. And we got a lot of input on why they're, you know, that some people were leaving, what they wanted to see better. And the first thing that came up was the income, the pay. Um, and then the second thing is they wanted a little bit more importance to their job responsibility. So as we see every year, we have a nurses week and we have a PT week and things like that. And so what we did after we got, we received that input, we went into action for the medical assistants because they are very, very important in our clinics and our uh, outpatient care centers. And so what we did, we put together some importance for them. Uh, we looked into pay raises. We looked into, um, different avenues that they can take in order to uh, be a lead medical assistant or to uh, follow through on the administrative side. We really tapped into what they needed for growth. Um, after that, we did see some increase. We did retain a few. Um, and every year now we go about, we have medical assistant week. We do a lot of uh, praising and thank yous and things like that what, that we do for the other um, for the other departments and so we, we kind of met them at their need and we saw a need because we do want to retain our people um, and just make sure that we're given the best best health care possible. Thank you Monique and I think you, you mentioned in there that you're one of those um, employers who have tiers for your MAs, correct? Yes, we have tiers in the um, healthcare clinics. So they can start out as a medical assistant. And like Christine said, um, prior to me speaking, medical assistants are multitaskers. And so we wanna utilize their skill. A lot of medical assistants, when I'm in the classroom and I'm teaching, a lot of people, um, a lot of the students, if we go to draw blood, they're not blood people or they're not wound care people. 
but they really, really enjoy the billing and coding part that we do or calling for insurance verification, speaking to the patients, you know, calling for referrals and things like that. And so we really try to tap, tap into what, what is actually their interest. Um, and we want to make sure that they're very, very comfortable in their role. And so, you know, everybody is not set for the back office. So what we really try to do is know the person that we're hiring or know the person that we're bringing into our academic institution. And that, that helps us better assist them um, in their travels. They may not stay a medical assistant. Um, like it was stated before, there is a bridge over and we do have a PA school. And a lot of the PA schools want them to have the clinical experience. So starting out in the medical assistant program and then working your way through PA school, we also have a histology uh, pathology program where they could be histologists. Um, and so we have a, a lot of different avenues that they can travel into. Uh, one of my students that just graduated last year, she did not get hired as a medical assistant. However, she was great at EKG and cardio. And so we hired her at the Bloom Center and now she's a cardio tech. And so she utilizes her skills as a medical assistant under her certification. However, she's out into the hospital and it's a, it's a little bit more money. Um, but she's allowed to do cardiac care under her medical assisting scope. So I, I think that we um, have a lot of pathways to offer them, but we really need to know who we're bringing into these institutions and how we can tap into their growth. And so that's what we did um, as well on the task force. And I think it was a great opportunity. Um, I was just getting here. so. It gave me a, you know, a good feeling to actually go out and talk to our employees and be that person that they that could really lend them an ear and really listen to them and then bring it back to the VPs and the executives and say, hey, this is what we really need. I sat down, we let our shoulders down, and we just had a conversation. And I think when you open that door for conversation, um, the retention level will stay, it will stay very high. Thank you, Monique. That is um, inspiring to, to learn about. I'll, um, I want to pose one last question to each of our panelists um, before we open up the floor a little bit more. Um, same question to all three of you. What do you, what do you think needs to change in order for us to meet our growing demand for MAs while also providing quality jobs that include career growth opportunities? So Monique, I'll start with you. I think the first thing that needs to happen, um, we, we see this as COVID hit. There is a lot of income decrease. And so with medical assistants, they are multitaskers and they do a lot in the clinic. And I think they're underpaid and that's my personal opinion, but they're underpaid because they could be, they are the clinic. Um, what I teach my students is that clinic belongs to you, whether it's the front office or the back office, you're very skilled to handle whatever comes in that door. And I think the first thing we need to tap into, even though it's entry level, it's healthcare entry level. And that speaks volume to the patient care that they deliver. And so the first thing I will really look at um, is the education that they receive, the certifications that they receive, and also what they can give to your establishment. We don't wanna just always hand them off to PA school or nursing school. We want to keep them in a practice that can basically take them, you know, higher in their income bracket because it is a joy to perform in the medical assistant role. And so the first thing I think that they need to do is really tap into who they are and what they are and what they deliver. Thank you, Monique. Um, I'll pass it off to Christine. So I'm going to second Monique. <laughs> we work together closely all the time. Um, yes, we do. So <laughs> I have to second everything she said. She's absolutely right. Um, this brings to mind also for me is something that we added in the toolbox. There's been a lot of research in the connection between the medical assistant and their role in ambulatory care and with the physicians and burnout 
And so if you have a good relationship with your medical assistants and you're treating them correctly, the burnout for physicians is much lower. Um, they rely on their medical assistants a lot. Um, basically, like Monique said, they're, you, you are the clinic. You're the eyes, the ears, the face. Um, medical assistants spend more face-to-face -face time with a patient than any other healthcare provider, um, specifically in ambulatory. And so um, there's so many different roles that can be grown. Um, I've seen... I've seen a role of patient navigator grow. And so rather than using, going out in the community and having a stranger connect with the patients, you know, as a community health worker, use the medical assistant because I already have a connection with the patient. So if we need medication adherence or, you know, adherence to your treatment plan, I have a relationship with you. If I call you, you're more likely to, I'm speaking as a medical assistant now, you're more likely to, um, you know, to, to, to answer and to be more honest as opposed to a stranger calling you and trying to get those things accomplished. Um, there's a bigger relationship, but just valuing the fact that you have medical assistance and looking at that role. And again, I'm just gonna go back to compensation because the role is big. There's a lot that they, you know, that there's a lot done by a medical assistant. Uh, and they really are there to perform a lot of tasks so that the high level assessment of patients can be done and so that doctors and nurses and PAs can spend that time at, at high level assessments, the medical assistants doing everything else. Um, so they have more time with, you know, to make those decisions and run those tests. Thank you, Christine. Two for higher pay. I'll third that. Uh, Juan Jose, on to you. Yeah, one thing I've been thinking about, you know, I really think that to make medical assistant attractive as an initial career, obviously we've talked a lot about the what comes after, right? And some of our ideas that assistants that we're kind of batting around and it is that the idea that like for middle skills occupations, this phrase, right? Middle skills occupation, even if to get promoted in the administrative or clerical role at um and for medical assistants, maybe like clinical manager, increasingly hospital systems or clinic systems are requiring a minimally an associate degree or maybe even in the future or later a bachelor's degree, right? So there really should start to be a, not an apprenticeship into a medical assistant role. There should probably be a, an apprenticeship from a medical assistant role into some high, higher up role, right? And, or there should be like an alumni program such that if you were a medical assistant and completed a program, you are now supported to re-enter school to either get an associate in, you know, administration, management, you know, business skills, or if you wanted to go clinical, you could go clinical to like some of those nursing or medical lab technology roles. So I think that there should be like a, there's a lot of like workforce programs that are bringing people into entry level roles in the medical field, but really some of that energy should be from the post entry level role to the higher up role. And people just need to understand that to make a living wage, you're going to have to go back to school and they're going to need a lot of support and encouragement to do that. I would like to piggyback Juan um, about the education. There's a lot of education that goes into the medical assistant role. That certification that they um, are eligible to sit for after the programs, that speaks volume for them. Um, if you really look into the, the education of a medical assistant, they're taught lobotomy, which is to draw blood, give injections. These are high level healthcare responsibilities. So when you really tap into that, um, like I said, we don't want to give them to the nursing program or because there's a high demand for medical assistance in the entry level position that they get. But when you really tap into that role, it's really not entry level. So I wish we could take that entry level um, title away from that role, because when you look really into it, they're given injections, EKGs, they're doing um, all all kinds of CLIA tests, and that's clinical laboratory tests. They're um, drawing blood. They know how to do uh, minor surgeries with the doctor, set up patient um, surgical trays, take out sutures, take off casts, things like that. And so I really wish that we could 
erase that because and pay a lot of attention, specific attention to the education that is given to that individual. And that's why we work so hard um, to tap into their goals, giving them the behavior interviews, making sure they pass the uh, aptitude test so that we can take them a little bit further. But when you put that, that title entry role on there, I think it's doing them a disservice of what they can really uh, do in the clinic. And I have to piggyback off of what you just said. I think that label came when larger medical groups started to buy up the, uh, then all of a sudden medical assistance became entry level. That wasn't a label of the past. Yeah. That really wasn't. Um, yeah, I, think that's, I think that's something we need to really, really focus on. Um, and that's, that's a conversation that we have with our talent development team. Really look at that job description because what they really put on um, the job boards, it really, it, it doesn't tap into what we teach in the classroom. And so I've partnered with our talent development team to basically give them insight. You're welcome into my classroom. In our ninth month, we do a career development course, whereas um, we take them through resume writing, we take them through cover letters, behavior interviews, we make sure that they're set up Whereas if they don't get hired by Northwestern, we could send them out into the world. And we don't only uh, work on their didactic and their clinical, but we set them up for a great future. And so when you get a medical assistant that comes from Malcolm X or Northwestern, you're really getting a, a individual that we've, we, we've paid close attention to. And we've allowed them to tap into the academics or reach what they need to reach in order to not be an entry level employee. April, I'm gonna jump in just for a second, if you don't mind. It's Heather okay. Hay from Northwestern. I, I work with Monique over here. And I, I just wanted to jump in about the entry level, the entry level stuff. I think it's more, um, you know, when we when we post a job that says entry level, we really mean a, a new graduate. Um, and so it's it's not really meant to be uh, you know, a reflection of of a lack of skill, but rather like a new, it, it's more of like a new graduate position. A lot of the job, um, a lot of the job boards I see do have that entry level, and I'll piggyback Heather as well. It, it speaks to the new graduate, but then it also speaks to uh, what what if you get an experienced um, employee? Of course, you're going to have to pay them a little more for experience, but we're talking about the job in a whole. And when you really look at it on the totem pole, it's a CNA. It's a medical assistant, a nurse, then a nurse practitioner, PA. And so on the totem pole, it does look like we are entry level because of the education that we receive. So I, I think the wording uh, with, in the job descriptions, I think they should tap into that a little bit more. Something on, on the lines of, uh, new graduates and then experienced employees. And that's just a thought. Thank you, Monique. I mean, I, I really appreciate um, this conversation. Um, I know we're almost at time, so I just want to quickly thank all of our speakers, um, Chris, Christine, Monique, Juan Jose. Uh, thank you all for joining us today and sharing your valuable insights. Um, if we did this in person, I'm sure we could hang around longer and have more group conversations, uh, but I really appreciate everyone participating in the chat. This is recorded and I will send it out in a newsletter, um, including the other links that have popped up in the chat. Um, and I also want to follow up on this conversation at our next CHWC quarterly meeting, which is scheduled for June 15th at 8.30 a.m. Um, I will be thinking about how to um, take what the CHWC employers are talking about in terms of career uh, pathway mapping and some of the, the questions that have come up today, such as, you know, RMAs 
is there a clear track into RN or are there more administrative roles or can we talk more about these tiers? Um, I really want to unpack, you know, how do we how do we uh, synthesize all this information and create some tools for employers and for job seekers so that they can understand a pathway up to a livable wage. Um, so we'll definitely be talking about that at the quarterly meeting. I hope you'll join us th there. Again, I'm sorry we don't have more time for open discussion. Um, does anyone have one lingering thought, something that's resonating, or one final question from one of our panelists before it's time? Feel free to just jump in. Okay. Thank you, April, for organizing. It was wonderful to hear the perspectives of some of the other institutions, and it really gave me thought about a little more focus on pathways. And I really enjoyed hearing Christine's focus on, you know, training in kind of um, diversity, inclusion, and the in biases. I think that's a really important aspect that, that I'm going to be looking at as well. So thank you for those insights. Yeah, and I just want also want to thank everyone who's joined us today. I know that there are a lot of people in this room who have um, who work directly with medical assistant pathways. So I appreciate you attending um, and your future insights. Also, I forgot that I I, I dropped a little um, survey link in the chat. Um, it's very very quick. Just want to hear your thoughts on this conversation. It'll help me plan similar conversations in the future and also to follow up on what we learned today. Um, so thank you again to our speakers. Thank you all for joining. Join us again on June 15th at 8.30. Um, and everyone have a great week. Thank you. Thank you.